Two lands, one heart. TJ's mother, Heather, is from Vietnam. She and TJ's uncle, Jason, and Aunt Jenny were separated from the rest of their family during the Vietnam War and grew up in an adoptive family in America. Many years later, they have learned that their parents are alive and well. TJ's mother and his uncle, Jason, have already made one visit to Vietnam. This time, TJ, his mother, his Aunt Jenny, and his American grandmother have made the long plane trip from Denver, Colorado to Ho Chi Minh City. They still have two more days to travel before they reach TJ's grandparents' farm. After two days in Saigon, it's time for TJ and his family to journey to the family farm. At 7 in the morning, a chartered van picks them up at the hotel, and an hour later, the city lies behind them. The brilliant green landscape of rice paddies, coconut palms, and tall clumps of bamboo look like the country TJ has seen in pictures. But even out here, the road is busy with bicycles, scooters, horse wagons, cars, trucks, and heavy carts pulled by water buffalo, the traditional tractors of Vietnam. With others... With over 70 million people in a small country, the roads are always crowded. Around noon, they stop in a small town for lunch. This restaurant seems just like an American one with tables and waiters and glasses of water. But what a menu! Grilled sparrows, eel soup, fried frog legs, bird's nest soup. Maybe if his brother Bradley were here, TJ would order himself an eel just to see if he would eat it. But for himself, he orders something familiar, fried chicken. Then it's back on the road, which soon begins to climb the mountains bordering the sea. TJ has never seen the ocean, and as the van tops the last ridge, he spots the clear blue South China Sea stretching forever before him. All he can think of is jumping into that big blue pool, but he has to wait until they stop in Na Dang that evening, where a sandy beach stretches for miles in front of their hotel. When he finally hits the beach, TJ can't believe his eyes. The beach is swarming with thousands of kids about his age. They try to play and talk with him, but TJ doesn't understand their language, and they walk away confused by his silence. Finally, he wades into the warm, gentle water and giggles as he bobs up and down. He wants to stay forever, but in the end, his mother drags him back to their hotel room. The next day, they start early. It's still a long drive to the farm. The mountains are steeper now, and looking down, TJ can see fishing villages in sandy coves hundreds of feet below. As the afternoon heats up and they leave the mountains, the landscape begins to blur into saneness until the driver slows and turns off the highway. Pavement is left behind as they enter a shady tunnel on a narrow red dirt road that winds between rice fields. Suddenly, everyone is awake, both eager and nervous. After six days of traveling, they are moments from the farm. He, the house stands back from the road, barely visible behind the dense stand of trees and bamboo. The driver honks the horn. Led by TJ's grandparents, a crowd of people runs out to greet them. They are weeping hysterically as they overwhelm Jenny and Heather. TJ is swallowed by a mass of arms touching and pulling him close. He doesn't know what to do. The crying and commotion scare him, but he seems the loving stream from his grandparents' faces with their tears. With his arms wrapped around Heather and Jenny, TJ's grandfather leads the way back to the house. Set beneath big shade trees, the house is made of brick with a tile roof. The family crowds into a small dining room and to talk over some cool coconut juice. Although TJ already knows how to say grandfather in Vietnamese, all the talk is through an interpreter. After 20 years of living in America and speaking English, his mother has forgotten her Vietnamese. Gigi would like to learn a few words, but it's hard to, but it's a hard language to pronounce. For instance, the word da, if you pronounce it with an upward tone like asking a question, da means headache. If you say it with a downward tone, it means peanut. TJ might ask for a bowl of headaches, and what would that get him? The next day, relatives and friends come from miles around for a family feast. It's like a big Thanksgiving dinner with dozens of relatives crammed into one house. Even with the tables in every room, people have to take turns eating. The American visitors are the main attraction. So many people are looking at them through their windows and doors that TJ can't see outside. From the kitchen comes an endless parade of dishes, some of them very weird to TJ. Who would think of putting spicy meat with fruit? Or of dipping sugary rice cakes in a salty hot sauce? Or frying a salad? TJ likes some of the food, especially the fried rice. Um, watch this, he says, and 
desperately lifts rice from his bowl with chopsticks. TJ wishes he could talk Vietnamese with his grandfather, but he's proud to show him that he can at least eat like a Vietnamese boy. When he finishes, TJ wanders towards the kitchen. Of all the rooms, this one is the most different from the houses in America. The only furniture is a table. TJ's aunts cook on the dirt floor in fireplaces with no chimneys, and the walls are black from the wood smoke that hangs in the air. Big kettles of soap bubble beside sizzling locks. There is um, no microwave oven, no electric stove, no blenders or mixers, not even a refrigerator. It's amazing to see a kitchen without any modern tools, but TJ loves it. It reminds him of his family camping trips in the Rockies. He takes charge of feeding sticks to the fireplace while the women of the family sit on the floor chopping and slicing. Outside the door is the washing area. Instead of a sink, there are several huge clay pots filled with water. The water comes from a well that his great-great-grandfather dug, a deep shaft about three feet across and lined with bricks. Leaning over the rim, TJ can make out a faint, a faint glimmer of water 30 feet below. His grandfather tells him how they used to pull water up with a bucket, but just this year they added an electric pump and hose. Ong is proud of the pump. It's much easier. Nevertheless, he wants to show TJ how they drew water in the old days. He throws a bucket down. There is a deep splash. Then he pulls it up by a rope, hand over hand. It seems like a lot of work for a bit of water to wash your hands. As the day ends, TJ spies the nose and warm brown eyes of an ox peering out of a small thatch barn. But it's time for his family to return to the hotel where they're staying, so he'll have to wait till tomorrow to discover the mysteries of the farm. The next morning, TJ can't wait to explore the farm in the neighborhood. Only a few acres, the farm would be considered small in America. But not in Vietnam, it's the perfect size for TJ, and every few yards he discovers something new. In the fields grow rice, soybeans, corn, and mulberry leaves to feed silkworms. There's a vegetable garden in front of the house. Lining the footpaths, trees grow coconuts, guavas, papayas, avocados, bananas, and mangoes. Bamboo and eclanopus provide wood and shade. The biggest trees have strange green fruits that grow right out of their trunks. Bigger than footballs and covered with spiny knobs, they're called jackfruit. They don't look very appetizing, but the inside are yellow and sweet. Now TJ knows why he hadn't seen any supermarkets. Everyone has a supermarket right in their backyard. One thing TJ is learning about Vietnam. It's a hot place and May is the hottest time of year. Every day, every day the temperature rises nearly to 100 degrees. People work in the morning when it's cool and the rest in the shade at midday. At home, TJ's mom would turn on the air conditioner. Here, people use old-fashioned ways to keep cool. His grandfather lies on a bamboo bed beneath a shady guava tree. The chickens climb onto the rafters of the barn. TJ prefers the hammock. By pushing off the wall with one foot, he can keep the air circulating as if he's rocking a bed under a fan. When it cools in late afternoon, people start moving again. Women wearing straw hats work in the rice paddies, and Uncle Theo grabs TJ for a walk along the dirt road. TJ is eager to go. He likes Theo, maybe because his goofy joking reminds him of his Uncle Jason, Theo's older brother. Theo looks like Jason and even laughs like Jason. At supper yesterday, Theo reached over to TJ's plate, snatched a whole rice cake, and ate it in one big bite with a big grin, just like Jason sewing off to TJ. On the road, people pass by them on bicycles carrying loads TJ would never see in Denver. One bicycle carries a pig as big as the bite in the basket. Another comes by with about a hundred quacking ducks tied upside down by their feet to a big wooden frame. Down the road, a water buffalo has the equivalent of a flat tire. One shoe has worn out and three men are nailing on a new one. They are metal like horseshoes, except that because buffalo has spit, split hooves, that needs two shoes for each foot. When men finish, the big animal lumbers into the irrigation ditch and lies in the water with only his head showing. Naturally, a water buffalo's favorite place is in the water. Although his neighbors use buffalo instead of tractors, Theo is proud of his family's oxen, which are more valuable than buffalo and easier, easier to command. TJ loves these gentle animals and is thrilled when Theo asks him to help plow a new cornfield. From the barn, Theo brings the oxen, the yoke, and the plow, and they head off for the field. The oxen follow like dogs, as if they know what to do. 
At the field, they even stand together, making it easy for Theo to hitch up the plow. Then, as simple as starting a car, Theo says one word, and off they go around the edge of the field. It looks so easy. Theo just walking along, occasionally tapping one of the oxen with a bamboo switch to give directions. The plow digging straight, deep grooves. TJ wants to try, but sees right away that even though the oxen are doing all the pulling, it's hard work at the back end, too. He tries to keep the plow upright and angled so it cuts to the right depth, but it's heavy, and TJ falls sideways into the dirt while the oxen keep pulling. After making two passes, TJ turns around. His furrows look like snakes next to Thea's straight lines. He glances at Thea, his uncle is laughing. TJ tries another job with his aunt, fight Paiu, helping her in the rice paddy. At this time of year, the rice plants are only a foot high and the main job is to pull weeds. Because rice needs a lot of water, the paddy is flooded. TJ steps barefoot into squishy mud, careful to put his feet between the stalks so he won't crush any of the delicate plants. Fiu shows him how to tell weeds from rice, and once he starts pulling, weeds are everywhere. It's hard work bending over in the hot sun with only a bamboo hat for shade. At home, TJ's main chore is to keep his room clean, a job that looks pretty good to him right now. TJ is dying of thirst after all this hot work. At home, he could open the refrigerator door and grab a soda. But here you have to harvest your drink. Ong hands TJ a special stick and takes it to a coconut tree in the front yard. Using the stick, TJ knocks down one of the heavy green coconuts, ducking so it doesn't land on his head. Then Uncle Theo cuts it open with a big knife and pours the sweet, clear coconut milk into a glass. TJ's not used to seeing water come out of the fruit, and although it tastes pretty good, he really ha rather have a Coke. Wandering back to the ox barn, TJ spots a bamboo canoe in the rafters. Uncle Theo, he yells. Can we take it to the river? The canoe is not usually for fun. Its main purpose is to carry farm produce down the river to sell it to, in town. But Theo can't pass up a chance to show off to TJ. With TJ's help, he carries the boat down to the water where he drops it with a splash. The river is perfect for learning to canoe. TJ, Theo and TJ paddle past farm fields and under big overhanging trees. A neighboring farmer walks along the bank with a herd of ducks. Around the bend, they drift past two boys washing their oxen. And later, a man crosses the river in a cart pulled by two water buffalo. The river hasn't changed since TJ's grandfather was a boy. It's a quiet place with no motors and nothing moving faster than a drifting canoe. As they paddle back to the landing, TJ's four girl cousins are waiting with mischief written all over their faces. Oh no, he says with a big smile. The water is so shallow, the girls can walk out to the canoe, and without warning, they start a water fight. In seconds, TJ is soaked. Theo jumps out laughing and leaves him to his cousin's mercy. Before long, they are all in the river together, splashing and laughing. Cousins are the same everywhere.